Hello everybody, this is C.J. Wiley with more Adventures on the Road. I've had a lot of questions uh, recently about uh, some of the older time players. You know, you got the uh, Moscones and uh, Harold Wurst and, you know, they were tremendous players. Uh, Luther Lassiter was my favorite and I never got to see him play. But uh, Wade Crane, who we called Billy Johnson, had seen him play. And uh, he's from actually over here, uh, Elizabethtown, I think, uh, North Carolina. And he was an amazing player. He would play the ghost um, with just the break in the first shot. I think it was on four by eight tables, but he would bet he could run out every time. <clears throat> so uh, when I was really hitting some top gears playing, uh, Wade Crane would tell me, you know, you're playing good, kid. He said, but Luther Laster could have given you the eight ball. And I'm like, really? He could give me the eight? Wade's like, yeah, you're not quite there yet. So, uh, you know, I was determined to, to change that. So a guy named uh, Johnny Morrow, not Mora from Canada, but Morrow from uh, Houston. He was a really good road player and... Uh, he had just beat Jose Perica, who they thought was the best money player in the country, in the world, I guess. But uh, Efren hadn't uh, really, you know, made his presence known as much as Jose at that time. So uh, Johnny Morrow had matched up with Jose Perica, and he beat him, getting a spot, the break, the first shot, and the last two playing nine ball. And he beat Jose. So he came to my pool room in Dallas during a tournament. And uh, a lot of the big time players was there, including Alan Hopkins, who, you know, I really had a lot of respect for Alan because uh, he used to be on Wide World of Sports and with Howard Cosell. And he did commentary uh, when Minnesota Fats and Willie Moscone were playing and, you know, all those top players. Sigal was involved with that a little bit, too. But Hopkins was uh, really impressive and one of the smartest pool players I think that ever lived you know he's uh, not only did he play well but he knew all kinds of uh, propositions he could take uh, the break in the first shot play in one pocket and in four tries he would bet he could run them all in one pocket I don't see anybody doing that even these days so uh, Alan was something special so I knew that uh, Johnny Morrow had 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 beat Jose with that game, and, and I really didn't want to try it. If Jose couldn't do it, you know, I really didn't think that, that I should be giving him that game. But Alan Hopkins came up to me, and he said, hey, if, if uh, you want to play that Johnny Morrow with that break first shot and the last two, he says, I want to bet on you. And I was like, really? You want to bet on me? Alan said, yeah, I think you can beat him here. Because we played on, uh, you know, really tough tables, triple shim tables there at CJ's uh, Billiard Palace in Dallas. <clears throat> so, you know, when he said that, I started like, man, I want to give it a try. So uh, Wade bet on me and uh, Roger Griffiths and Alan Hopkins. Uh, so they bet a little bit on me. And, and uh, we proceeded to play. And after eight hours, I'd only missed about three balls and ended up beating him. I got him so frazzled that he was trying to break and jump the ball off the table so he could get ball in hand behind the line, and he still couldn't win. So anyway, I ended up winning that match, and uh, Alan Hopkins came up to me, and uh, I gave him the money that he had coming, and, and he motioned me over to a table away from everybody. He said, I want to show you something. And that's when he showed me a little technique to tell if caroms are dead, like when you're going into two balls, you know, how to tell where the other ball's going. So you can tell if, if you can make caroms, and just as important, you can tell when you can't make them. You can also tell when you're shooting a ball and going into another ball, you can tell where that ball's going. So it's a little technique. Uh, I think I've shown it on one of my videos, but uh, I'd have to have a pool table to, to show you, but I will. I've used it thousands of times since he showed me that. So then Wade came up, and I gave him his money. And I said, uh, I said, okay, Wade, tell me the truth now. 
Could Luther Lassiter have given me the eight tonight? And Wade looked at me and he said, kid, nobody could give you the eight tonight. <laughs> so uh, that was a big deal for me, you know. Those are little hurdles that you, uh, you know, you go through, and I'm sure you have at your level, you know, where you can't quite beat somebody maybe, and then you beat them. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, a kid here, uh, I say kid, he's not that young, but here in Sanford, and I showed him how to align on the shots, and, and he was getting beat by a lot of players, but he's got a lot of heart. Joseph is his name, and uh, he just loves pool, and he comes in, and, and I really want to work with people that have that kind of passion. So I gave him a three-hour lesson, I showed him the alignment, and I showed him what he was doing wrong and, and how to do it right, and, and, and he started doing it. And man, he's just pleased as punch. <laughs> he uh, beat a guy last night that had beat him before. And uh, they were just playing $50 sets, and he beat him out of $350 playing $50 sets. And the guy's like, man, I don't know what happened to you. And uh, so he's in there now, and nobody will play him. I told him, I said, it's lonely at the top, isn't it? <laughs> he said, man. He said, what is it? He says, you start playing good. Now the guys that used to beat me won't even play me. I said, yeah, w welcome to my world. But I said it's the journey that's the fun. There's not really a destination. I mean, you can just keep getting better because there's always going to be a level of players for him that's a little bit better. And as he works his way up that ladder, you know, it's just uh, it's just a lot of fun, you know. And I recommend it to anybody, you know. Fix that foundation of your game, you know. That's the most neglected part and the most important part. So, uh I try to show it every chance I get, but, you know, to, to fix it in person, it takes, uh, you know, it takes me three hours, but it usually takes about two to two and a half hours before somebody clicks. And then they don't have to aim anymore. If your alignment's really good, you don't have to worry about any aiming systems or anything like that. It just comes naturally because you use, uh, I mean, your your subconscious is like a mega computer, and once your alignment's right, it's like uh, they they have a saying with computers, garbage in, garbage out. So if your alignment isn't right, even that mega computer uh, that you have called the subconscious still can't be consistent because the information isn't right. But once you put in the correct alignment, it's just like a navigational uh, system. you got to put in the right address. It has to know where you're starting, or it can't tell you how to get there, right? I mean, this is all common sense. Nothing that I teach isn't common sense. It's just uncommon because people have been teaching this stuff for years and years and years that just, it's just a little bit flawed, just to put it mildly. And uh, an example of, of, I think, why comes uh, with Willie Moscone. Willie Moscone was doing an exhibition, and he's shooting all these great shots, and, and he's telling everybody how he did them. So he shoots this shot, and he, and he explained how he did it. And this guy on the side said, well, Willie, I read your book, and that's not how you explain to do it in your book. And Willie looked at him, and he said, well, I wouldn't know. I've never read it. <laughs> so, so this guy was going by... Willie's book, like, you know, it was the gospel, and Willie had never even read it, so he didn't proofread it, so so he just gave somebody all the information, they put the book together, but he never double-checked it, and you know, pool's pretty complicated to explain anyway, I mean, I've written a great deal about it, and, and you know, I have to do that myself, I can't just tell somebody and, and have them write it down and, and be able to communicate you know, the, the fundamental systems and techniques that, that the champion players use because they probably don't have a reference, you know, unless they're a champion player themselves. And, you know, I mean, I don't know of a lot of champion level, you know, players that, that could write a book without a ghostwriter or, or somebody to help them. So that's kind of where I think it originated. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, a few other older time players that, that were, you know, really got my attention. And Harold Worst was one of them. You know, 
he wasn't the worst. He was the best. He was another one that, that played like Lassiter. And, uh, you know, in, in some games he played better because he played all games. He played three cushion billiards and snooker and, and, uh, you know, the guy, he died at a very young age. So nobody really got to see him really peek out. I can't remember how old he was when he passed, but, uh, maybe 28 or, uh, or thirties. I don't know, but he, he was pretty young. Uh, I don't know if he, uh, maybe had a, a drinking issue or something that, that sped up his, uh, visit here with us, but, uh, but he was a legendary player. So I can't take anything away from him. I, I saw a video of him playing, but it was kind of grainy and, you know, it was hard to tell. Plus they were playing on fairly big pockets. You know, the, what brings the cream out of the crop is, uh, is small pockets and, you know, four inch pockets really brings it out. And that's, uh, that's what we have here at, uh, Sanford at the Speakeasy. Not all the tables, but he's got three of them that have four inch pockets. Mm-hmm. And boy, you have to be sharp, especially if it gets humid. But uh, once you can play on those tables, you can play on any table. And uh, Mark Gregory, the uh, he's probably the best pool table mechanic in the United States, and he's a friend of mine. And I was down in Alabama, <clears throat> and this guy told me that he had watched me play in Atlanta on a table called Jaws, and it had four-inch pockets, and it was really tight. And this guy told me that he saw me run 28 racks in a row playing the ghost in nine ball. Well, I mean, I was nice to the guy and everything, but I, I really didn't believe it. I was like, you know, maybe, are you sure you're not exaggerating a little bit? You know, with time, sometimes your mind plays tricks on you. And uh, so I really, that was a nice compliment, but I, I really didn't believe it. It's literally true. So I was in Atlanta. And I'm down at Mark Gregory's house. And I told him, it came up something about that table Jaws. And and uh, I told Mark, I said, man, you're not going to believe this, but a guy in uh, Alabama said he was in Atlanta and watched me play on that table. And I ran 28 racks in a row playing the ghost, uh, break ball in hand, if you miss, you lose. He said I did it 28 times in a row. And Mark looked down you know, like he was thinking about something. And I was like, Mark, what, what is it? He said, man, I don't know how many racks you ran. I said, you were there? He said, yeah. He said, Johnny Archer and I was there and uh, we were watching. He said, man, you were deep into a zone. He said, I don't know how many, we didn't count how many racks it was, but you played over an hour and ran out every time. But you see, when you go into the, uh, you know, and there again, I'm sure you've had this experience at least for a few hours where you go into a zone and you can, uh, you just make everything and you don't think about aiming and you don't think about, you know, the mechanical stuff. You just become part of the game. I, I always said there's a point where I go from me playing the game to the game playing through me. It's like self-expression. You know, there's arguments over whether pool or pocket billiards is a game or a sport. And my position has always been it's an art form. It's a way of self-expression, like martial arts or, uh, you know, like a like a painter painting or sculpturing or, or a musician, you know, where they get into these zones. They don't know the audience is there. I mean, there's lots of examples of musicians that have just been incredible and i look at pool like it's the same thing because when you get in that zone it's like you know you're part of the music you're part of the painting you're the you're the brush (laughs) you know i uh the uh mentor i had dalton leone the asian man i've talked about him several times and he's the one that had me read zen and the art of archery for my mental game but he would say, CJ, just try to become the cue ball. And boy, what great advice that is. You know, if you don't have anything else as far as mental game, just try to become the cue ball and try to feel, you know, because to play at a high level, it isn't who has the best eyesight. 
it's more about feel and touch and uh, uh, and being able to have a sense for the for the pockets and the balls. You know, I, every shot I shoot, I look at the object ball last, but when I hit it, I feel that connection to the cue ball, and I feel the object ball hit the pocket, and I always watch where it hits the pocket before I move my head. So that's how you stay down on the shot. It's not counting to three or something like that, because who wants to stay out down on the shot if they're missing it, <laughs> you know? But if you just train yourself to hit every shot and watch where it hits in the pocket, because that's really good information. Just like if you're shooting a gun and you're shooting high to the left, you want to calibrate lower to the right. That's the aiming system Omaha John told me about. He just said Kentucky windage, and that's what it's called. It's basically you just you just keep calibrating to the center. And when you're shooting a pistol or a rifle, you, you know you adjust your sights. But in pool, you know you, you know I can adjust my feet slightly, but but the reference that I have with my feet controls the rest of my body. So my body's in the same position every time because the foundation is the same every time. Because the left foot controls the left side of the body and the right foot controls the angles of the right side of the body. So if you get that foundation right, and most people don't teach it right, you know, again, uh, I've got some videos on my YouTube channel that show that, but, but it's, it's really powerful when I, when I show it in person. And I've been helping a lot of people around here and they're, they're getting really good results. I mean, that Joseph is just, you know, it, it makes me feel good to see somebody that happy. You know, because this is more than just pool for me. You know, the game is the teacher. That's that's deep. You know, I'm talking about life. You know, I'm talking about if you can play pool at a high level, you can build bridges from that knowledge, from that wisdom into other things. And you can start to see things with different eyes. You have eyes that can see and ears that can hear on an entirely different level once you have that reference correct. And uh, so uh, there's a couple other guys that are really getting good results because, you know, I'm just really firm with people as far as if you just keep doing what I'm showing you, it takes two to three weeks. It did me. And, you know, I probably hit more balls than uh, anybody that I teach. But once you get it, the game gets way easier and your alignment is the key to the aiming and the cue ball control. There's a few other things that are real important, like the mechanics of the stroke and, uh, you know, how you get that type of cue ball control. I mean, I show that too, but not after. I mean, it has to be after uh, the foundation because, like, the stroke, if it was a structure, it would be more like the uh, the middle of the building. You know, the top of the building really is the uh, the head and the eyes, and you need to have them positioned in the same direction as the center of your chest, not your right hip, like commonly taught. That's like putting a gun up aligned to your right hip and then trying to go over and aim at it and shoot. That's not how you do it. The way I show it, you put your chest and eyes on that alignment position, and I only have two of them for every shot, either center to center or center to edge, and then I allow my mind to triangulate it off that fixed position. So, uh, but you have to know how to do the footwork or you can't because the, uh, the right hip will get in your way. I've always said that, you know, the human body isn't made to play pool. The human mind, and, and you could include the eyes and, uh, you know, the body, mind, and eyes. But once you learn these tricks, it's almost like it reverses and your mind, body, and eyes were made to play pool. And that's where you can reach your full potential and play like the pros play. Because, uh, you know, when you get in, just like putting your fingers correctly on a piano, once you do that, then you can take advantage of your uh, natural abilities, which comes really from the subconscious. Because I warned Joseph a while ago, because he was talking about how great he's playing. He did it the other night and just kept firing balls in, you know, which I think is really hard to do. Today, it wasn't quite like that because I told him I said you know once you get this and you bring conscious attention to a subconscious activity and the fastest way to do that is to tell somebody how great you're playing 
from my experience, it'll leave me. Just momentarily, but until I get my mind right that it's not me doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm an instrument that it's doing it through, so to speak. And this is kind of a Zen concept, you know, I mean, you know, becoming what you're doing. That Zen and the art of archery is so good. He was doing archery and his wife was doing flower arrangement, but, but archery and pool are very similar. So, uh, but anyway, I just wanted to talk about some of these older time players and, uh, you know, I wish Lassiter was here to talk about these subjects right now because I guarantee he knew this stuff, you know. Being able to teach it is a, is another story, you know. I mean, I was in a position where I could uh, allow my playing to go down to learn what I was doing. Again, if you bring conscious attention to a subconscious activity, and when you're really trying to figure out what you're doing so you can teach it, you know, it'll it'll leave you. And and but I was in a, a unique position because I didn't have to make money playing pool to uh, to survive. So, you know, I had other businesses and uh, was determined to find out what did I do when I got into that dead stroke and went for hours and made everything I shot at. Because it seemed like I was just aiming at the center or the edge of the object ball every time. It just really didn't make any sense to me. Now it does. I know what I was doing now, and I can teach it. But there's a process to it, and it starts with the foundation, which is two or three weeks. It goes to, uh, you know, then I work my way up the building <laughs> to, uh, and I show I show other things my first lesson, you know, the, the proper way to release the cue. That's, most people are doing that kind of backwards, too. But there's a way to do that that gives you a lot of power and precision, and, and it's effortless. But uh, But your wrist has to work right. Your wrist and your hands, like Earl Strickland told me one time, I said, what's the key to your game? And Earl said, it's all in the hands. <laughs> and he's right. It is all in his hands. I don't think you should put tape on your fingers necessarily, but <laughs> that's another story. I wish I could help Earl with his foundation. He's off on that. I mean, he still plays great, you know, but his consistency would be better if he stands like he used to stand when I first started playing him. He's, he's got away from that. And I tried to uh, give him a hint last time I saw him because we were in London and Steve Davis, the snooker champion, was telling us that when he got older, he uh, found that if he was more square to the shot, which means his chest in the center of the shot, he played better. So uh, I asked Earl, do you remember when Steve Davis told us about uh, when he got older that, that he stood more square and got better results? And Earl goes, yeah, I remember that. I knew he would. And he, he told both of us at the same time. So then Earl started standing square, but his feet weren't in the right position. So, I mean, he it was... It was better, maybe, but, but it's still not right. But the way he used to do it is exactly right, because he's the one of the guys, when I learned how to do this, uh, Earl and Efren were the two that I was really watching, and they do it exactly. Not this, you know, It's not exactly the same as far as, uh, uh, you know, you can step your feet a little bit different. You know who does it really well, and exactly like I do, is Sky Woodward. I asked him, uh, we were doing some commentary together, and I said, Sky, when did you learn to put your left foot parallel to the line of the shot? And he thought for a second, and he goes, I don't know. He said, somebody told me that it was better to do that. I tried it, I liked it, and I kept doing it. I was like, well, wasn't that easy? But he's a phenomenon. I mean, he's a he's a prodigy like I was. So so we pick up on things maybe a little bit quicker. Uh, I mean, I caught on to it pretty quick. But but again, it took me about two weeks. I didn't let myself uh, compete again for three weeks. And then I played 15 full-fledged professional tournaments in a row and never finished out of the top nine. And most of those tournaments were between second and fifth. I was in the hunt the last day every tournament and just kept getting beat by guys like Mike Siegel and uh, Johnny Archer and, you know, Buddy Hall and 
And there's no shame in that because there's days where the rolls, you know, and the break just doesn't cooperate. And these guys have mastered the game too. So, you know, uh, I never, I always called second first runner up <laughs> sounded better, but I'm just kidding about that. But, uh, but, uh, but again, there's, uh, you know, people don't really remember who gets second in a tournament and, I've got beat in the finals in some big ones. Two ESPN finals, I got beat in the finals. I won one, and the next two years, I got beat in the finals. If I would have won all three of those, then they couldn't deny me the Hall of Fame. You know, it's funny. I had a guy. Uh, you know, he's a he's a gamma male, and he uh, he was getting on me today about you know something that I talked about in a video a couple of days ago about the uh, what they call conspiracies <laughs> and uh, I told him he said how do you believe in these conspiracies and I said well I believe I'm talking to you and he said well, what do you mean by that I said well I think your parents had to conspire to have you <laughs> I don't think he quite liked that response but it's true you know, you can't do much of anything alone in this world, you know, and, and when two or more are going towards the same, the same goal, it is a conspiracy, but it's not, you know, uh, everybody looks at it like it's some kind of crazy thing, and how dare you, because, uh, you know, that conspiracy theorist wasn't even used. If you do a search uh, before what happened to JFK, they coined that phrase, and it went up from not being used at all. Conspiracy theory was used like three times, like before that, that, that there's any record of, in like newspapers or magazines. But after that, they coined that phrase and made it to where anybody that questions something that happens on TV or, uh, you know, staged wherever, uh, you know, is a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Which, uh, man, I got to give them uh, accolades, you know. I mean, we're up against the world's greatest hustlers. But they have a weakness. They don't make mistakes. See, it's hard for me to read somebody that makes mistakes because, you know, they're all over the place. But if I'm around a hustler that never makes a mistake, I can read them because uh, basically... If they're not on my side, anything they say, I know is altered. So uh, that's a good rule of thumb. So anyway, I'm going to uh, wrap it up. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, my film crew coming in in two weeks. I found out there's somebody else. And it's some of the big boys that have uh, the same plan. I just got contacted. So uh, the plot thickens. But I'm 100% confident in uh, what we're going to do to revitalize pool at a level that, uh, you know, I don't think has ever been done before. And the, and the key is, uh, you know, I'm not even going to get into that. <laughs> I talked to my partner for an hour today and... Uh, so, uh, you know, some of the stuff I'm, uh, I'm not going to be able to make public right now, but it, I'm sure, you know, if you love pool, you're really going to enjoy what we're doing because we're going to bring out the best of the game, the, uh, the top entertainment, excitement, and strategic value in a uh, way that, uh, that just hasn't been done, at least like this. Because I think pool can be a huge, huge game. And there again, it's not just a game, it's an art. It's an art form. And if we get the general public to realize that, it's not just balls bouncing around on a, on a flat surface, you know, because pool doesn't make much sense until you start to figure out what it really is. And uh, it's just a incredible display of physics and geometry, and the strategic value is incredible. And there's more than that off the table, you know, negotiating and matching up games. There's guys that come in this pool room that are really successful business people, and they talk about learning uh, everything that they 
uh, <laughs> a couple of my buddies there. That's uh, Joseph and Jimmy. If you uh, watched our podcast last Monday night, if you haven't, you need to see it. It's really strong. We brought out a lot of good stuff. But there's much more. And we're going to do a podcast live on my YouTube channel. And we'll tag it here on Facebook. Uh, for some reason, Facebook didn't allow anybody to watch it last time. But we'll iron out the wrinkles on that. But uh, my YouTube channel, just search YouTube, CJ Wiley. And uh, watch those last four or five videos, but especially the one we did on Monday at the Speakeasy Billiard Place. Uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm happy with how that came out. And we're doing another one on Monday night. Probably about seven o'clock uh, Central Time, or I'm not 100 percent sure. I'll uh, I'll let you guys know on Facebook. And uh, all right, let's see. Boy, we got some some people. Let's. All right. Thanks for the inside info, man. Our community of the Greater Seattle area has grown tremendously during the last five years through a lot of effort of many dedicated people. Looking forward to seeing where you're going with this. Yeah, Seattle. I said Linda Carter, uh, Wonder Woman. <laughs> now, nah, she's a great player in her own right, and she filmed that match I played in Seattle at Nar Nardo's. Uh, we played $20,000 sets, and I missed about seven balls the whole time we played and was one game down, but won the money because he was spotting me three games going to 22 which uh, is like, you know, one and a half going to 11. But, uh, you know, Efren's, uh, <laughs> he's a tough compadre to beat. And, you know, I think he still is the best all-around player that ever lived. So uh, Luther Lassiter, Harold Worst, Willie Moscone, you know, uh, they couldn't have beaten Efren Ranch. And uh, that's just my opinion. So I know this uh, spurs uh, controversy and uh, different opinions, but but Efren, um, you know, he he's really the leader of all these. Uh, like Dennis Orcolo and uh, Roberto Gomez told me that uh, he showed me some really cool shots, and I said, "Man, where did you learn this?" He goes, "Efren, <laughs> yeah, the magician." So anyway. Hope you're all doing good, and I uh, look forward to sharing some more of this stuff, because there's a lot. So join us Monday evening, and uh, it'll probably be around 7 o'clock, probably Eastern time, uh, but you can check. And uh, if you aren't a member of my YouTube channel, go there and join it, and then hit that little bell where you get notifications, because it'll tell you when I'm going live. And then you'll be able to see all of the stuff that I'm getting ready to do. Because I'm shifting into high gear. It's time. You know why? Because the game is the teacher.